What's up everyone, welcome back to another video. As always, my name is Orlando Martel, and this is Martel Dynamics. Today is gonna be the last chapter of Hicks and Gracie's book, Breathe. It has been a great journey through Hickson's life. This chapter is like a wrap up of everything and what is happening today in his life at the present. Remember that in last chapter, everything ended kind of in death. His son died, then his father died. It was pure chaos. I mean, we have already seen throughout the book that when he had been having marital problems, problems with his wife, but he had been till now like suppressing all his problems just because he had to fight. This chapter begins by Hickson saying that he spent five years rebuilding himself and his family and working through the grief of losing his son. The only reason he could find to know that he was and he could still be happy were his children, his other children, his family, and jiu-jitsu. So the first thing he did was to realize what were his problems and you know, he realized through his son's death that life was short. He couldn't stay and, and ignore his problems. He had to face his problems and just continue his life, right? After Hoxton's death, Kim and him came together to manage a crisis, right? They raised their three other children who developed strong wings and were taking off on their own directions. But one day, after all Kim and him had been through, I called Kim into the living room and told her I wanted a divorce. She was shocked and asked me how I planned to do it. It's simple, I said. You can have everything. And that is what happened. Before I left, we finalized our divorce and I signed over the house in Pacific Palisades, the farm in Brazil, and the apartment in Rio to Kim. So Hickson came to realize that you could have all the money in the world and you could still be somehow unhappy, right? He says that the problem with money is that people always want more of it. If you have $10,000, you will always spend 20 or 30. If you have $1 million, you will spend 1.2 million. So you will always be looking for that extra car or for that bigger house or for this other thing. When money becomes more important than happiness, your life passes you by because you can't lower your guard and enjoy yourself. So what he did is that he went back to Brazil, right, to see what he had to, he wanted to do with his life. I heard in Cron Gracie's podcast with Joe Rogan that the way Hickson explains it is something like if you plant a palm tree in Brazil, you get coconuts, but if you plant a palm tree in America, you don't get any coconuts. You have to go to Brazil. It's, so, it's something like that. The point is that he went back to Brazil to find himself again. He thought about coming back to MMA and fight one more fight and, and concentrate himself on that. He, he thought about just keep uh, giving classes. He thought about opening another Jiu Jitsu Academy, right? But what he came to was that he realized that he had always enjoyed giving seminars. He says, I had always enjoyed giving seminars. I found them stimulating. You parachute into a foreign environment and have to quickly make sense of students you have never met. As always, when Hickson is around, he explains throughout three or four pages that in some occasions in Paris and in other locations when, where he gave seminars that, by the way, he gave seminars all around the world, but there was sometimes someone that just wasn't there just for the seminar, right? right? There was always someone that was there to challenge him. And at least every time and every experience that Hickson explains, he defeated every single one. And the way he did it was that after the seminar, all the black belts and just everyone that wanted to roll with him rolled with Hickson. And Hickson usually tapped all of them, tapped all the black belts, everyone in the seminar. As we saw in literally the whole book, Hickson criticizes what jiu-jitsu has become today. He explains, and this is me saying, telling you in my own words, jiu-jitsu has become a sport. And what's wrong with that? Today, you hear everyone talking, I mean, in this community at least, you, about the sport. This is a sport, this is jiu-jitsu, you have to practice, you do this and you do that. But 
In reality, jiu-jitsu is not a sport. Calling it a sport is watering it down a lot. Hickson thinks that jiu-jitsu is not a sport, it's a philosophy. If you take jiu-jitsu as a just a sport, then you are limiting jiu-jitsu in so many ways that you're just kind of destroying jiu-jitsu in a sense destroying what it is, what it really is. We have heard this in previous chapters, but I'll read to you some extracts so you can understand. As rewarding as the seminars were for me, I did not like what I saw when I dove headfirst back into the world of jiu-jitsu. Competition and the need to play within its rules had transformed our martial art into a sport and a game. A top jiu-jitsu competitor might have five bouts in a single day, why would he go all out and exhaust himself in his first match when he could get ahead on points and then stall and run out the clock? Many modern competitors adopt smart strategies that minimize their risk and maximize their competitive rewards. They become experts at holding advantageous positions, but the fluid movements and the improvisational back and forth exchanges like the ones Holes and I used to have are a fraction of what they once were and should be. So Hickson talks about this a lot. He thinks that making Jiu Jitsu into a sport is watering it down. There's another concept that I've heard it before in his podcast, but I had never read it in the book. And it's this concept of invisible Jiu Jitsu, right? I always wondered what invisible Jiu Jitsu was. And it's all about feeling. It's all about feeling Jiu Jitsu and not just thinking about it, not just practicing, but just you are one with your movements, you know? The way I understood it from what he wrote is that you are so good and you practice the art so much that you do it almost unconsciously and you flow with the movements. It's not even as much effort as it is just flowing with all the moves. For me as a teacher, seminars are both exhausting and exhilarating. But many people can teach arm locks and chokes, but I approach teaching in, much, in a much more holistic manner. In order to learn my jujitsu, you have to feel it. This is why I call my practice invisible jujitsu. Without this tactile knowledge and mastery of the basics, a student can learn every technique in the world but still not understand the essence of jiu-jitsu. After this, in this same concept of today's jiu-jitsu commu community watering down the sport, he explains that jiu-jitsu is, first of all, a self-defense mechanism. He says that today, I think I've read it in, and I, I think I've read this in a previous chapter, today, some people, achieve and get a black belt before they actually know how to defend themselves. And I think I heard it in a podcast too that there are some black belts that, that if they found themselves in a real street fight situation, they will lose and they will get basically killed because they know the sport, they know the points, they know black belts. I mean, he's talking about black belts. They know every position, but they don't know how to block a punch. And Hickson thinks that if you don't know how to block a punch, your black belt basically don't mean anything. I'm not even a blue belt, but that is, you know, it's surprising to me that there are some black belts that just don't, don't know these basic things. So after being in Brazil for some time, Hickson started to find stability in his life he bought a sheep car he was he says that he was spending only five percent of what he made so he was leaving very cheap he didn't spend a lot of money one day specifically one night i went to a santana concert in rio with a friend and saw an attractive woman holding a motorcycle helmet standing nearby i did not approach her but we made eye contact and she smiled at me after the concert after the concert ended i went down to ipanema beach to eat pizza at one of my favorite restaurants and whom do i see but the woman who smiled at me at the concert eating with her family 
Hickson went to talk with her, you know, something started and he started a relationship with this woman named Cassia, right? He says that they, their relationship worked very well because please, if you think differently or if you interpret it differently, let me know what you think in the comments. But the way I saw it is that Cassia was an independent woman and she was doing all her own things just like by her own. So they were not trying to like live I mean, they were living together, but they not they were not living as one as one entity, as I would think a marriage is. They were just like two different people just enjoying themselves, and eventually they got married. And yes, but the way their relationship worked or and works to the pre in the present is that he don't object to her doing her things, and she don't object to him. So they are living their separate lives, and they don't disagree with one another and that's how it works for them one big part of this last chapter and his life in general as i know it hickson wanted to unify the jiu-jitsu community with all its faces i mean the sport community the more uh basic community the old community the new community everyone into this organization called jiu-jitsu global federation and he launched the organization in america in 2012 as i think i understood it from the book right but he came to see that a lot of the issues that he was seeing in general in the community that we have talked about were impeding or were just obstacles in his effort to unify the jiu-jitsu community although we got off to a good start and got a great deal of positive press, egos and vested interests soon began to get in the way. It got harder and harder to define, much less reach a common goal. One problem was that Jiu Jitsu has split into different factions that need not communicate, less train with one another. In the old days, a Jiu Jitsu fighter was prepared to compete with or without a gi and also fight Valetudo or MMA. In the modern world of Jiu Jitsu, many gi and no gi fighters only grappled and ruled out fighting Valetudo or MMA. With this, Hickson realized that he was just not going to be able to unify the Jiu Jitsu community. As I understand, the Jiu, -Jitsu, the, the Jiu Jitsu Global Federation is still a thing today. I don't know what it does or its effectiveness, but I, I know it still exists. I think there's a web page in the internet. If I found it, I can show it in the video. But yes, Hickson ends the chapter by explaining some last experiences of his life. He explains that in his personal necklace, he always carries a triangle representing Jiu -Jitsu, Gracie Jiu Jitsu because Gracie Jiu Jitsu's symbol was a triangle, but nowadays I see a lot of Jiu Jitsu academies using the triangle in their own way. So I don't know if they copied or whatever it was. The idea of base is reflected in the triangle. That is the symbol of Gracie Jiu Jitsu. If I push a ball, my energy will project and make it roll away. If I push a pyramid, it will stay rooted because of its powerful base. Even if I throw that pyramid, it always lands on a solid base. If my base is solid, I am ready to move and take any opportunity, either to deflect an opponent's energy or, or to use it against them. If I have both a base and a connection, my opponent will be forced to follow me like the tail of the comet. So that is the symbolism of the triangle representing Gracie Jiu Jitsu. He doesn't like cats. He was not a cat man. He then found this cat. He was good with birds. He was good with a lot of animals. He took care of them. It was, it was him making peace with himself and his spirituality somehow. And, but he didn't like cats. One day he found this cat that was injured and he took care of, him, of the cat. And what do you know, Hickson, you know, Hickson made, made a friendship with the cat and then he was a cat man. He talks about being on different TV shows in Japan and America and he 
ends this actually he actually ends the chapter by talking about how strong your mind and mentality has to be to be successful at anything he talks about this experience in a tv show where they were giving what two hundred dollars or something like that i don't know what they were giving the point is that in the tv show there was a doctor that made pressure on some pressure point in your feet and if you lasted 30 seconds you win and nobody nobody ever won so hickson went to the show what do you know he he just you know mind over matter he lasted the 30 seconds and he won and the doctor and the doc and the doctor asked him like how did you do it and he just said with all due respect i didn't see you as a doctor i saw you as my opponent in a fight i was expecting pain and defeated the pain with my mindset on my best day now i am only five percent of what i was as a fighter but Hickson finds meaning. Helping his students to become better people is what fills him, is what is where he finds meaning. So with that, the book ends. There's an epilogue which I will talk about right now because it's like a two-page epilogue. The epilogue is about where when he received his red belt in jiu-jitsu. So in order for someone to have a red belt, of course, you have had to have the black belt but Hickson explains that it's tradition in his family that for a black for a red belt you have had to be a black belt for a minimum of 40 years to be eligible 40 years to get a red belt after Horian and his brothers invaded one of his seminars I'll put it on the video after they invaded the seminar they basically made the ceremony right there they gave him the red belt Hickson was just like look I don't deserve this. I don't care what my accomplishments are. I have not had my black belt for 40 years. And Horian was like, look, because I say you're a red belt, you're a red belt. And you know, they put it in him, but after the seminar ended and, and the ceremony ended, he put his red belt on um, some secure place, whatever. And he stayed with his own coral belt, which is the belt, you know, that has red and black. The book actually ends with this paragraph. I have fought my entire life from pre-black belt matches to challenge matches and in-house tournaments, from jiu-jitsu to sambo, from wrestling to valetudo. When people ask me how many bouts I've fought, how do I count them? The numbers make no difference to me. What matters is that I always led from the front lines and represented jiu-jitsu with all my heart. I may no longer fight, but I will always be a martial artist. So with that, people, the book actually ends. There's like a glossary of terms for those that are not uh, familiar with jiu-jitsu terms. It was a great book with a lot of lessons. I am a firm believer that you don't always have to learn about making mistakes of your own. You can learn by analyzing and just understanding and, and, and just thinking about other people's mistakes and specifically people that have achieved so much in what they do like Hickson. I think that there's a lot to learn here and that's why I always love to read biographies of men, of people and men specifically that I admire because it teaches me a lot on how to be one. With that being said, thank you for just being in this journey with me. I'll make one last video of, of the review of this book as a whole. Till now, I've been reviewing as I read the book chapter by chapter. I'll make one more video on reviewing the whole thing and that will be for this. So if you have any recommendation for me of reading another jiu-jitsu book, another author, whatever of this topic, let me know and I'll just see you in the next one. Bye.